Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name is Yona. I'm a fourth year uh, podiatry student from CSPM. And today we have a special guest with us, uh, Dr. Oxman, who is a podiatrist from Chicago, Illinois, who runs her own private practice. And she is the wonderful host for the podcast. She's a DPM where she basically shares the insights and experiences from a variety of women, women podiatrists and just basically empowering them as well as the future field of students as well as podiatrists to make this whole multidisciplinary action and affirmation for all of us to be a part of. So I just want to introduce Dr. Oxman with us today. Wow. Thank you, Yona, for that like <laughs> wonderful uh, introduction. I am so happy to be a part of this today. And thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. And um, we do really appreciate your time because I know you're a very busy person and you're, again, running your own private practice. So um, this is going to be helpful for a lot of students as well as other doctors or future residents who are going to go in private practice one day or just want to learn about more about the field. So I'm glad you are joining us today. Well, great. I'm happy to help any way I can. And I and I mean that. So, yeah, let's, I'm excited. So. We're just going to ju jump right away into this. So the first question being, do most podiatrists specialize even further after they're done with residency or whatever residency they do? So great question. I, for me, since I am tending to now more specialize into um, orthoplastics and lower extremity nerve pathology, like I would like to say yes on that. It, but it doesn't have to be podiatry is already kind of like its own specialty as well. So, um, that's kind of the really great thing that you can still have a do everything, but still have this portion of your practice that you can start focusing on, especially like a younger practitioner. Like, um, I think that is kind of a trend we're seeing, like, a niche, right? We always hear niches. And if you can specialize in something and be that person in your community that is able to do maybe something that other um, podiatrists or foot and ankle surgeons can't, then that's just able to highlight your, your own skills and your own um, practice that you work in. So yeah, I think we're seeing a trend in that. Oh, well, that's great. Um, I, and I, I notice I've talked to some of the podiatrists around my local area that are starting to specialize even more, especially in the wound care field. That's a big hot topic that, I mean, that's a whole nother discussion in itself. But <laughs> yeah, that's one of those things that a lot of people like to get into and sports medicine nowadays with the sports teams and now traveling with different sports teams that a lot of people don't know that, you know, there are podiatrists who do specialize in that aspect of the field. That's really cool. Very. And like also fun that you can transition your pra practice. Like if you're um, and if after a period of time, or you want to start your own practice, like you have that ability, like you can create whatever you want, like this prep, this field, you can make podiatry what you want it to be. So it's really kind of a cool subspecialty specialty. I need to put that in quotes and hang that above my bed. <laughs> you can make it whatever you want it to be. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to the second question, did you find yourself wanting to specialize or try to remain well-rounded? I guess I semi-answered a little bit, but I'll dive a little more into it. That I came from, I trained, I did my residency out in Washington at the Franciscan Foot and Ankle Institute. Um, my residency director was Dr. Hutchinson for a couple of years and transitioned to Dr. Clifford. I was very, like, we had excellent surgical training. I got like pretty much my hands on everything, everything from forefoot clinic to rear foot reconstruction, like X fix muscle flaps, you name it. So I then did a fellowship that then specialized more in peripheral nerve and orthoplastics and more into those flaps. Um, so starting my own private practice, like I have this well-rounded, very surgical training that I feel like I need to utilize fully. Um, but maybe in the future, we'll then maybe have my own, um, just like lower limb nerve practice eventually. But I would say like my practice right now is like half and half. So I gotcha. still get to do everything that I like, everything that I've been trained to do, but still have my little niche as well that I'm building. That's no, that's great because I think 
I kind of resonate with that, especially if I'm going to go to residency. And by the way, your residency program is top of the line. I've only heard great things about it from all my classmates who exited at your program. Um, but yeah, I think a part of me is I still want to keep that well-roundedness, hopefully when I get out of it, because this is three years of your life and you want to main, make sure that you maintain those three years of experience that you gain and maybe on the side start to gain that little niche like you were describing to sort of further maybe some some of your passion further down that route so i think what you said is great and i think a lot of people can understand what your perspective is and that's definitely something i want to do in the future yeah and i also like to think when i'm we were doing this to help patients right and everything goes back to the the patient that guess what? Like I have a really, I would love to have a almost like fully surgical practice. I'm going to not lie. Like I still have my general podiatry patients as well. So like there's times where I'm trimming a callus and guess what? They're just as happy as the person that I can do like a nerve procedure on and help them with pain. So I try to keep that in check in my mind too. And like my ego that I'm here to serve. Right. So use everything that you were taught in the beginning. And then eventually like you can focus on what you want to. (laughs) And, you know, I, I just want to add one more thing. I don't mind actually debriding a callus or trimming nails once in a while, because, you know, it, it helps break that endless cycle of standing in the OR doing surgery all day. And as a student, I sometimes felt like, okay, Maybe I I, I don't want to do surgery today. Maybe I just want to do clinic and see some patients and talk to them and have that personal interaction. I think that kind of makes podiatry really interesting in itself because you have this multidimensional aspect of it that makes it great in the OR as well as the clinic life. And you combine those and you have this perfect little ball of sunshine that you can just do whatever you want with. Yeah, I really couldn't say that um, any better. And I, I agree 100%. Like that's one of the main reasons why I went into podiatry that I like to know my patients. I want to have that relationship, but I also want to be able to help them conservatively or with surgical intervention. So yeah, you said it. (laughs) I'm glad. Okay. So third question, what are some of the most common subspecialties that podiatrists may have? Well, I would say um, off the top, I have like dermatology. So like if you're really interested in dermatopathology you can solely focus on that sports medicine we mentioned wound care like limb salvage which there's a wider range of what that could mean um limb deformity correction um pediatrics uh orthoplastics is um a a hot term these days in my in my world um peripheral nerve uh, reconstruction trauma Honestly, if there's something that you're, there's also, um, like diagnostic imaging, like I have podiatrists that read MRIs, x-rays to do ultrasounds just solely. That's like the, what their practices. Um, I know there's podiatrists that have a vein center as well. So like, if you have a passion or like something that really, like for me, it was nerves, like I'm like, I'm very interested in that. I want to, that's what I love. Like you can make your practice, your career out of your passion. So. And I, I, I love that. I, you know, something funny that me and Diksha kind of stumbled on, it was another specialty called forensics podiatry, yeah. which yeah. I was like, really? Like, uh, do you have something to say about that? <laughs> well, no, like, um, one of my guests on the podcast, she, um, Dr. Answer, Elizabeth Answer, not sure if you're familiar with her, but she yeah. is, she was a p- police in the p- police force before, and she yeah. actually is part of, I think, the forensic podiatry. So it's very, yes, like just showing you like how niche and like specific you can get in this field. It right. truly is whatever you want to make it. <laughs> no, it's true. And I, I think it it's sort of just i I, it's sort of i want students to feel encouraged about this especially pre-medical students who don't feel like podiatry leads anywhere besides just the foot and ankle sure we specialize in that but there's so many sub specialties within our specialty that makes it so fun and so interesting like you said if you have a passion about nerves you can go into that you can do research into that you can do some fellowship that can be related to that it's amazing how much opportunity there is to expand your horizon 
even after residency, because that's not where it ends. It's just like the beginning where you can start to specialize in little things here and there, which is really cool. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I know people who have been out 15 years that are still learning and like transitioning in their practice and like finding something that they're passionate about and like making that transition to a more specific um, subspecialty. So there's always time if you're willing to put in that effort and work. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so fourth question here, out of the main ones that we just talked about subspecialties, mm -hmm. which one is the most profitable in your opinion? Because we get this question a lot and I always say wound care because that's what as students, especially at CSPM, that's what we're exposed to the most. And a lot of the people here do a lot of wound care, a lot of the private practice. But in your opinion, what do you think is the most profitable? Well, I'm going to kind of maybe turn this question around on you because sure. I am, um, while I think we can have a great life, right? And we can make a great living in this field. If you're looking to focus on a subspecialty or something specific in this field just for profit ability probably should in any field of medicine should right. probably um rethink your career choice just because if you're solely going to that you aren't going to be fulfilled <laughs> you're not going to love what you do yeah. um so for people that are asking that question, like, yeah, of course I want to make a great living. And I know I will, because I'm focusing on something that I love, that I'm passionate about, that I want to like help my patients. So there's no way with my work ethic, my knowledge, my skills that it, I won't succeed and have a good, good life and lifestyle. So, but I guess if I had to answer your question, probably wouldn't care. Okay. Okay. Um, no, and I think you bring up a really good point. Um, I want to add on that. Sure. Wound care now, insurances change everything. So that's mm. another thing. Right. Just because now MRIs used to pay really well. Being part of a surgery center was like a big thing. Like things change. So that's why don't go into something just because you think that's where the money is. Go into it because that's where your passion lies. Right. And I, I think flipping the whole question on its head like that is a very valid point, because I know for one thing, um, a lot of people like if you again, like you said, if you're into this field for the profits, that's the whole wrong reason, especially in any healthcare profession, you shouldn't be doing that regardless. Um, but I also like to just mention to people that um, you could just move different states with a more affordable living. I, I think a lot of people want to live sort of that glamorous lifestyle. Sometimes like California is a big hot topic and um, I'm from California and I, I, I love California. Don't get me wrong, but realistically, if you have a family and you are trying to open up a practice and you're looking at your financial goals and your budget, it doesn't mean you, it's not unattainable, uh, untainable, you know, it's just more so that you just have to look at where you're living at and realistically what your goals are. I, and California is one of the harder places to sort of develop a practice and be very profitable. It's, it's a hit or miss, but in other states there, you can be very successful as well. Um, and I think people just need to sort of accept that idea. Um, and it's hard to accept it, but I think it's just one of the few things that you have to think about, especially if you're thinking about profit the whole time. Yeah, absolutely. And Yes. Like I'm, I'm currently practicing in a state that I would, people would say is like a heavily saturated state for podiatrists, but, um, every, if you're an individual, you have your own set of skills, you have your own personality, you bring something to the table. And if you're like in it for the right reasons that may take, I'm giving myself several years, right? <laughs> like it's going to take time, but it will happen. <laughs> so, it's already happening. Know. It's yeah. already happening. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'm sorry to go about your question, but I wanted to at least say that. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm glad you talked about that because that is a very valid point. And I think people really need to know that, especially moving forward. Yeah. And sorry, I'm going to dive into that. Like if you like, um, do find like a subspecialty or a certain topic that you're really interested in and like, you love that and you become 
I don't know if the expert's the right word because you should always be like learning, but like a, a thought leader in that people will, oh, that's where you can invite it to like speak and like people want to learn from you and there's additional um, opportunities in that aspect too. So like just do find something that you love about it and it'll come. <laughs> uh, and, you know, again, you have the most experience um, and I think that's the most important, especially that takeaway again as well, because uh, just from experience that you're talking about, I think as we start to sort of, and I digress a little bit here, but um, especially that podiatry now has more social media presence, we're starting to see more of these speakers and more of their research being posted. And it just comes to show like these people who have done 30, 20, 15, 10 plus years of whatever they're doing, it's starting to show and people are starting to recognize that, okay, if they're being posted like that on social media, they're being invited to these big conferences, I can do that one day. And it gives them hope, you know, and I think if it, if it revolves around that and you can kind of find your niche and passion through that, it only sparks great interest that you have a successful path moving forward. Yeah, ab absolutely. <laughs> okay, so fifth question, is having a healthy mixed practice better for revenue? Mm. maybe I'm too new in my private practice to give you a full answer on this. I think if it probably doesn't hurt, right? Like when we have a fully surgical, eh, let me rethink that. <laughs> it's okay. Um, depends how you manage that practice, right? Like there's practices that are just purely more general, and some that are purely surgery, but like if your outflow, like, right, you're spending is more than you're in, no matter what kind of practice you have, that's really the basics of it, right? So it kind of goes on how you manage it. Right. Um, if you keep your costs low and you have good in, inflow or like um, cash base that way, like that's, that's the basics of revenue, right? So kind of depends. I have more of a, um, right now, like mixed, like surgery and clinic. And I like that because, um, not just building those relationships, but I do like, um, having a surgical aspect, but as we know, when you do do surgery, there's a global period. So that can be, um, a challenging aspect if your and clinic is full of post-ops fully. Could you just expand on what global period means? I, I know we hear this term thrown a lot. Um, if you could just summarize it really quick, what it means for our viewers. For yeah. Our viewers. After um, a surgical procedure, procedure, there's a period of time, usually it's a 90 days, that anything, any visits um, that lead back to that surgical procedure, um, you don't uh, get a charge like a clinic visit for. Now, if there's an additional issue that's brought up during one of those post-operative visits, then that's um, something that you can uh, bill for. But under that global period, anything with that procedure, it's covered underneath your surgical um, billing, let's say. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are kind of scared of that global period, but I, I feel like you shouldn't be scared about that thing. Um, it just means that you're just seeing a patient within a certain amount of time and whatever be it, you just have to take care of them regardless. And again, it goes against that whole idea about profit, right? Um, where if you're not in it for the profit and you're thinking solely for the patient, which you should be doing, the global period should not be a problem for you, especially if you're a successful type of person who has a good mindset, positive mindset, helping patients. That's the most important. Yeah. And it's there that's part of it, right? And post-op, you have to make sure that you, they have the best op, um, possible outcome, but they're not usually coming in every week either, like the, the same patient. So I think um, it's a difficult answer to give a full 100% answer on. No, and I, I, think, I think you still hit it on the dot because I think it really does come down to a lot of like your personality as well as what you want, because there's people who 
want to just be clinicians all day versus people who want to be in the OR all day versus people who are like, I will be too bored if I do one or the other. I want a little bit of both. So it's sort of nice that we kind of have that spectrum to work with and there's no clear cut answer, but that's what makes it so great because it's a discussion all the time that we usually have with so many students uh, just moving forward. So Yeah, yeah. And for our final question, and this is sort of a big type of question that um, Diksha and I were part of a YouTube video with Dr. Jabal, who's a uh, founder of Med School Insiders. And this was something he brought up to us, but we kind of wanted to ask a full on podiatrist um, what they think about it. So the question is, as far as surgery versus clinic goes, would you say that one is more profitable than the other if one had to choose? And um, I've had people ask about us doing surgery all the time, thinking that this would be the best idea. So what do you think about that? Uh, I think on paper, the answer after what we kind of just talked about, like, um, and I've talked to several, lots of people that own private practices, I would say it depends what kind of practice you're in, right? Like a private practice is going to be different than how a multi-specialty group versus a hospital is set up. Right. And the different, um, like different levels of services and kind of their level of pay as well. Right. So if you're in a large group that has system down for like a fully surgical clinic, then that's a well-oiled machine and they know what, um, is profitable for them, but in a private practice, and I'm sure if you talk to private practice docs, like of course a more clinical, um, practice tends to be more profitable or have a higher revenue. Um, but I think it all leads back to how you manage your practice, how you manage your, um, whatever group or hospital setting you're in. And then also like, what's, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? Like, right. Like if you want a fully clinical, um, practice, that's amazing. And if you want to use your surgical training, don't let the revenue be the sole lead. Cause it won't get you through a full lifetime, um, right. in medicine. Right. So. And I, I think, again, like you said, I think it's a very hard sort of question, you know, and it's one of those questions, again, it's up for discussion and it's really, it comes down to just the individual, you know, it, you, you can have recommendations, you can have sort of this insight on what things are like. And I think that one of the issues that I think students like me and, you know, underclassmen have is just like, we're going to go through residency, but sort of what's life going to be like after residency and you know and i think one of the biggest factors that we kind of think about is just our whole student debt you know um are we going to pay this off uh, is is what we're going to do be enough to pay off the annual interest that's piling up and um just moving forward we're, it's always that sort of like okay i'm doing this for the patient i know that i know that i know that but at the end of the day i also have to pay a little bit more here 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 so is private practice the way to go but then again i have to spend three to four years trying to build my practice trying to build a brand versus being a being working in a big multi-specialty group or being working at like a kaiser system where everything is laid out with you it's very formal it's a rigid structure it has everything set out for you and you get x amount of money and each of you work you get a little bit more or however it works but so sort of like which route is the best route for me and it's again that's an ongoing discussion and that's an endless debate and there's so many factors that play an extreme role in that in that uh choice so i i like dr oxman said it, it really just depends on what you're really looking for um but we obviously i i hope people and viewers understand from this just this talk is that you're going to have the skill set it's just up to you and what you want to do with it. Right? I, I think that's the most important takeaway, especially as podiatrists who are going to hopefully one day specialize even more if you want to, is sort of your sort of your rationale as you move forward. Yes. And know that just what you do right when you come out of residence, residency, your first job doesn't have to be your last, right? Like, <laughs> don't, don't um, forget that. Like, you can always change. You can always adapt. You can always move. You can always like go find something that um, 
brings you more joy, right? Or passion and revenue as well. Like you, um, for me, mine was to start my own private practice, to give myself that time to adapt, to grow and build something that how I want to practice podiatry rather than someone telling me how to practice podiatry. But that's me. That's my personal. That's going to be different than my husband, who's a podiatrist, right? Like, so like it's to each your own and you just have to really follow what's best for, for you. Yeah. And you couldn't have said it any better. I, I, again, um, that's basically all the questions we have for today. Thank you, Dr. Oxman, for giving us your lovely insight on everything that there needs to know about one of these like hard questions that we always get all the time. Uh, we get a variety of these questions. So hopefully our viewers can just take away some knowledge from this interview. Um, and I will link uh, the podcast of She's a DPM in the description down below. So all of you, you better listen to it. It's really good. And there's like a recent one on externships and tips and advice on that. That's really good too. And I know if you're students, you better watch that. Um, so keep on the lookout for her videos because she's doing a wonderful job with her podcast. She's only one of the few podiatrists who are actually doing a podcast with a variety of different podiatrists. So be on the lookout for that. Again, link in the description down below. And if you guys look, like this interview, like this experience, subscribe to our channel because we're going to bring more podiatrists, hopefully on our channel moving forward, who are answering these questions, these tough questions that you guys always have for us. So again, thank you, Dr. Oxman for, jo Oxman for joining us tonight. Yeah. Thank you for having me. This was fun. And I hope, hope the answers were, were <laughs> enough. So. Uh, they, were, they were great. Thank you again. Yeah. Thanks. Take care, everybody.